All right, uh, good morning to all of you. Um, so what I did was that because we had about 10, 12 days break, I asked myself um, what we are doing in this course. So I put it here so that it is a, in a good context setter. So these are the topics that we have in the syllabus, five topics out of which we are currently looking at topic number three, biomolecules. And um, biomolecules will be dominated by proteins. In proteins, we looked at the classification based on size and shape. We also looked at the various levels of uh, structures for globular proteins. We discussed myoglobin and hemoglobin to relate the structure and function. And we started a little bit, but today and tomorrow we will discuss about Ramachandran map. We should be done by tomorrow. Then we will move on to nucleic acid, carbohydrates and lipids. But those discussion will not be as extensive as proteins. Okay. So in um, the last um, lecture, we began discussion that led to Ramachandran map. We distinguished configuration and conformation. And I also gave you models to look at torsion angles, the definition and convention. Okay. So what I will do now is to give the basis for Ramachandran map. The Ramachandran map itself I will tell later, but the basis is very important to understand. All right. So this is something that many of you will be very familiar with. This is for butane. I have a model here. Okay, um, here. So if I assume that this uh, red sphere and this blue sphere are methyl groups, then methyl CH2 CH2 methyl. This is a butane. And we see that the um, dihedral angle can be anywhere from 0 to plus 180 or minus 180, total 360 degrees clockwise or counterclockwise rotation. And we identify three, um, two probably you know, main conformations. One is the um, staggered. I would like you to sort of you know, use these models. All right. So I would like you to sort of identify the methyl groups. I don't know which ones you have, but the methyl groups will be the terminal ones, you will have to assume that the sphere is the methyl group, okay. And um, will you be able to set it to the, uh, you know, um, the trans or anti conformation A, conformation A, will you be able to set it in your model? Model, this is the, you know, um, ah, so this is the anti conformation. Uh, come and collect models here, okay. And you also should be able to um, identify conformation C. Will you be able to do it in a plus 60 or minus 60? There will be two here. You should be able to set the confirmation C. Confirmation C plus 60 minus 60. And will you be able to get confirmation B? Confirmation B will be okay. So you should be able to identify confirmation B and confirmation D. How will you get confirmation D when both? you know, red and blue are eclipsing. Are you able to identify that? Anybody has a difficulty in identifying this confirmation A, B, C, D? Is it clear confirmation? Huh? You should be able to figure out A, B, C, D. Okay. So which ones are the, you know, stable confirmations here out of A, B, C, D? Which ones are stable conformations? Huh? A, A is it? Okay. And then how about B? B is not. How about C? C also will be there. Are you clear which ones are stable here out of A, B, C, D? Any? Huh? Which ones? Huh? A. How about B, C, D? So what happened? Which ones are stable conformations here? Huh? Anybody? Kushbu. A, B, C, D mein kaun sa? A is more stable. Aur? T, K, aur? How about D, B, C? Okay, C and A. What about B and D? Here. Okay, huh? B and D. Okay, why does that happen? So, um, I will tell you about this Van der Waals interaction. Um, HCl. 
Okay, is there a dipole moment here? HCl, huh? What is the direction of the dipole moment? Delta minus and delta plus, okay? And depends on the convention, some books use this convention, some books use the opposite convention. We say that there is a permanent dipole. Why is there a permanent dipole? Why is there a permanent dipole? Because chloride is electronegative compared to hydrogen. So, most of the electron density will be, electron cloud will be around the um, chloride atom. But let us assume that there is a helium atom, okay, or it can be even neon. What is special about helium and neon compared to hydrogen and chloride? They are inert gas elements, am I right? Is it not? Is there a dipole in uh, helium or neon? If you were to simply take, huh? no dipole. Can you qualify this? Can we say that there is no permanent dipole? Is there a temporary dipole? Huh? Huh? What is the temporary dipole? This is again, I brought a ball here. <laughs> I pulled out <laughs> soft ball. And so if I were to sort of represent this helium or neon, okay, it will be like a sphere and somewhere in the middle will be the nucleus and this region will sort of tell over a period of time where we are likely to find the electrons. We can say this as the electron cloud or if we normalize we can also call it as electron density, it depends on what we are looking at or probability density, electron density. So when we say that there is no permanent dipole, the distribution of this electron cloud around the center is very uniform, okay. But what happens is that, you know, there will be a, you know, slight, if I were to slightly press it here, okay, a little bit press it here, then what happens is that there can be a dipole uh, means that unequal distribution, okay of the electron cloud, there will be a slight, you can imagine a slight, you know, bump here. So what happens is that there can be a delta plus and delta minus. This magnitude will be very, very small. Magnitude of this dipole will be very small, but we also call it as a transient dipole. Transient means what? Exists for only a small period of time, okay. Small period, small is vague, but I am still using it, transient, okay. So, but we also know that, suppose I have two dipoles, okay, so I use this to say that this is delta plus and this is delta minus and if I were to have one more dipole, what is the best way that two dipoles can interact so that it is stabilizing? It will be like this, is it okay? So we say that this is head to tail or tail to head depending on head and which is tail, okay. If I were to put the two dipoles like this, then what happens? This is repulsive or attractive? between these two, this will be repulsive. Is that clear? Am I making sense to you or am I saying things which are not clear? This is repulsive interaction, but I can also have something which is like this, is it not? Okay, delta plus, delta minus, this also will be repulsive, am I right? So if you look at two helium atoms or only two neon atoms, there will be transient dipoles, but the dipole induced by one helium atom or neon atom with respect to other is in such a way that there is always a attraction, okay. This is what we call as a induced dipole, induced dipole interaction. Is that clear to you what is induced dipole? What I have done here is that I have taken only two atoms, but in reality I have so many helium atoms together. So each of them will be sort of inducing a transient dipole, but the net interaction is always attraction as long as they do not come very close to each other. This is the induced dipole and what I have written is that this actually was proposed by, you know, Van der Waals to explain, this is the name of the person, note the spelling here, it is not Wall, the Warner, it is not that and Johannes Van der Waals, okay. He proposed it to explain the deviation of, you know, gases from ideal gas law, okay. So that is how we came to know that there are transient dipoles even here, what it says is that distribution of electron density around a nucleus undergoes rapid fluctuation 
and gives rise to separation of the centers of electronic charge and nuclear charge. This creates a transient dipole and resonates with that of a neighboring atom, resonates in such a way that there will be always attractive interaction. But this is difficult to imagine when we have so many atoms in which direction it is there. Such transient charges orient in an attractive configuration, net result is that there is an induced dipole, induced dipole interaction. In biology textbooks, this induced dipole, induced dipole is what is known as the Van der Waals interaction. Interaction between induced dipoles is Van der Waals interaction. If it is a permanent dipole, we simply call it as a dipolar interaction. But there are some books where even these permanent dipolar interaction are Van der Waals and interaction between a induced dipole and a permanent dipole is also collectively represented as Van der Waals. It depends on the source of book. In biology literature, only induced dipole is the Van der Waals interaction. So based on the magnitude, you know that interaction between two permanent dipoles is stronger okay, and that will be greater than one induced dipole and one permanent dipole and the strength will be greater than two induced dipoles. So it is a weak interaction but collectively they make actually significant contribution. So this is the what we are discussing is the basis for the Ramachandran map. Okay, all right. So Van der Waals interaction is that between two induced dipoles and it is always attraction is also called as London's dispersion interaction. London is the name of the person who studied this London dispersion interaction. I have not written London here, I can write. They occur even between the atoms of noble gas elements. They are mildly attractive, strongly repulsive. What does that mean? I will tell you in the next slide. Their weak interaction but cumulative contribution is substantial and dominant interaction with close fitting and proximity are important. What simply it means is that when you have two dipoles, induced dipoles, they are very close. The interaction energy will be significant otherwise it is actually very weak interaction and we observe Van der Waals interaction in lipid bilayers, coiled coils and many other biological systems. We find that in fact hydrophobic effect you see that a polar groups coming together they are held together by Van der Waals interaction. So what is this mildly attractive strongly repulsive that I have shown here many of you who are familiar with the you know Van der Waals interaction energy curve you will be immediately able to identify this. What I have on the X axis is the distance, here I have used angstroms and on the Y axis is energy, some arbitrary units, although I have written kilocal per mole, it is somewhat empirical. So what I have shown is that if I were to look at two helium atoms alone and if you were to sort of separate them to whatever large distance, it is a very mild attraction, extremely small but it is never repulsion, okay. So it is almost zero but not zero, this black one, okay. So this attraction will be always negative, very mild. But because of attraction, if you keep bringing them together, attraction will actually keep increasing. That means it becomes more negative and favorable. But at same time, there will be repulsion and the repulsion will be steep. So it's important to know that repulsion is steep. That means the slope is very high, whereas attraction will, be, will also decrease. But we don't really go beyond this because the repulsion takes the you know um, the dominant position. This black is actually the sum of the repulsion and the attraction. So the Van der Waals interaction energy actually follows this black. Okay, so there is a certain distance at which the energy of attraction is the energy total energy is the minimum, and then then if you bring the two atoms closer, it keeps increasing, and the two atoms which are interacting can be intermolecular part of two different molecules, or it can be part of the same molecule. There are some caveats here as to intramolecular, I will not go into details. But basically I wanted to tell you that Van der Waals interaction is between two induced dipoles, it can and um, it is mildly attractive but strongly repulsive. So there is a certain distance, if you come closer then it becomes repulsion. One of the ways you can you know, um, uh, you know remember Van der Waals interaction is by considering somebody, it can be your parent since I am a parent, I am telling it can be your parent or it can be your roommate, okay. So you like them if they are at a distance, okay. If they come very close to you, if they check your mobile phone, if they keep nagging you, then interaction becomes repulsion, am I right? You say that, okay, do not get into my life, stay there, am I right, is it not? So personal relationship you can relate to Van der Waals interaction, it is very easy to remember, okay. It can be your roommate, your friend, your batchmate, your papa, mama, whoever it is, okay. So this is, you know, attraction only at certain distance, if you come very close, there will be repulsion. In fact, repulsion will be very strong, okay, attraction may be very mild. 
Is that for clarity what is induced dipole, what is a permanent dipole? Are there any questions about this? Now um, I want to go back to this here and ask the question why is the conformation B and D high in energy, it is a relative potential energy, some arbitrary you know values all they have given K cal per mole they are very empirical values. This is dihedral angle. Can you tell me why conformation D, you can use the model in your hand to tell me why D is higher energy and A is lower energy. Can you tell that? You must have studied this. One of you. Pick A. Can one of you tell me why A, B, C, D, can you rationalize qualitatively? Probably you want to do. Ah, qualitatively, yeah. In conformation D, the CH3, CH3 are eclipsed. They are eclipsed, so I am holding it here. In fact, you can actually take the model in your hand and in case you don't have model, oh, I also don't have, Kali, okay. <laughs> Bag is Kali, okay. So, so uh, if you can actually see that they are close, it is a very qualitative, you will not be able to measure the distance exactly. Okay, this model is okay, go ahead. So, uh, we, we can say that the distance between CH3 and CH3 is not what minimum whole CH3. Is such that there is certain amount of repulsion. Yeah. Here, it will be somewhere here qualitatively, okay. Some that hydrogen may overlap. Two methyl groups and in uh, chemistry, you know, uh, jargon it is called bulky groups, am I right? Yeah. Bulky is again a relative, relative to hydrogen it is bulkier methyl, okay. Then conformation B, conformation so this is a eclipsed conformation, okay. There are three eclipsed conformation, this is one, where, where is conformation B, can you set in your model conformation B? In the model that you have, can you set your model to conformation B, eclipsed? This is eclipsed, I am holding the two methyl groups. Can you set it to conformation B? B may kar sakta hai kya? Kidhar hai, aapka pas model hai? So can you set it to, so, ha, so that is eclipsed, is it? Which group is eclipsing which group? Which group is eclipsing which group? Methyl group is eclipsing a hydrogen atom. Okay, so methyl group is eclipsing a hydrogen, hydrogen is relatively smaller, that is why the repulsion is less in B compared to conformation D. In conformation D, two bulky groups are eclipsing here to one bulky group and one hydrogen. What about C and D? Where is the difference between C and D? Eh? You have, give it to Pravalika. Why is C slightly higher in energy than A? Sir, because of Gauche interactions taking place ah. between the methyl groups. Because of the Gauche interactions, you get Gauche interactions in butane. Sir, uh, because uh, if uh, in the C position, the both the methyl groups are at uh, a 60 degree angle. At 60 degree angle. What about A? Uh, but in A, they are exactly opposite to each okay. other. So we say that in A, the two bulky groups are maximally separated. Okay, so there are three staggered conformation that will be D and two Bs, they are you know, eclipsed and three staggered are C, A, C because it is symmetric, these two C will be same. Is that clear to you the why the energy profile of butane looks like this? Because we are going to use this as the basis to understand the Ramchandran map, okay. Is that okay with you? All right. So that is what is shown here, okay, this is the uh, conformation angle, this is the relative energy and this is the anti-conformation, relative. whatever is the energy of anti, we do not know what the energy is, but if we assume this is 0, relative to that Gauche is 0.9 kcal per mole, first eclipse is 3.8 and this is 4.5, okay. So you do not have to remember these numbers as long as you know that eclipsed conformations will be higher in energy than staggered and depends on the bulkiness of the group, you can actually have more or less, you know, uh, energy relatively. Is that clear to you? Okay, so then what I want to show you here is that why do we say that anti-conformation is more stable? You know, I asked you which conformation is prevalent, anti and gauche. So that we will use using this here. Okay, so I will write down things here so that it is easy for you to understand. Okay, so what I have shown here is that the population, okay, suppose we take say one, femtomole of butane. How many molecules of butane will be there in one femtomole? Femto is 10 power minus 15. That will be multiplied by one mole will be, Avogadro's number is how much? 
am i right approximately okay so almost like 10 to the power of 8 molecules will be there even though it is one femtomol is it not okay so do all these 10 to the power of 8 molecules of butane which conformation they will be in huh they will be in a b c d which conformation a who said a a is it okay they won't be in b most will be in Huh? Most will be in A, some will be in B. How about C and D? No, B. Yeah, sorry, this will be C. C and D, uh, sorry, B and D? Mostly. So, how do we know this most? What she is telling it says most, how do we get that most? That we get using this formula here. Okay. So, E i is the energy of that conformer and what is the energy of that conformer? It is 0 for anti, 0 0.9 for gauss, 3.8 for eclipsed and 4.5 for this D conformation. Okay? These are the relative energies and what you do is that this you plug in the EI value, R is the gas constant, T is the temperature in Kelvin, you take the exponential of that and you compute this for each of the four conformations. Okay? A, C, 2Bs and 2D, okay, you can compute that and if you were to sum that, that is the partition function, use that as the denominator and Fi will be the fraction of the population of the ith conformer. So, what I have done is that I have computed that here, okay, these are the values that I have given. Um, we can do that, you know, probably I can do it here to show you how we get that. So, what I will do here is that, so this is the confirmation A, am I right? This will be confirmation C, confirmation B, confirmation D. I will have energy in calories per mole that will be 900. I am just plugging in the values that I already have. Okay, 3800, 4500. Is that clear to you what I have done? I have converted them from kilocalorie per mole to calories because my other you know, values R and T are in the calories per mole. So, what all I have to do is that this will be equal to minus of this divided by R will be 1.98 star T will be 298. Okay, this is what I have done. Is it clear to you what I have done? Okay, what I have done here is that I computed the EI, I have 0 0.9, 3.8, 4.5 as the values that I got. This I got from this graph here. Okay, Over here. So, from here 0 0.9, 3.8, 4.5, I got the energies for that and this I will divide by gas constant into temperature, I will add a minus and I will take exponent. Okay. So, this is what I am getting. Now, if I go to this my excel sheet here, whatever these 4 are there that I will take it as sigma. Sum of from here till here and this okay so this is the sum of the four ei values okay okay so this i will have for uh, minus 0 divided by rt exponential this is for confirmation a then i will have exponential minus 0.9 into rt this will be for confirmation c then exponential minus 3.8 divided by rt for b and exp minus 4.5 divided by rt this will be for d so i will add all these numbers that will be my z here okay that's what i have done now what i have to do is that i have to divide each of them is equal to divided by minus 15.59 how did i get this 15.59 this is the sum here what happened yes My God, what did it do? Is equal to, uh, let me do this here. Is equal, uh, array, how shall I get? Is equal to this divided by minus 15.59 total. What happened? Am I making a mistake? Ah, uh, 
what we are telling is that this should be exponential now. Thank you so much. It gives this little triangle here saying that you have not done it correctly. Ah, is it okay now? I make a, still make a mistake. No. Exp. Thank you so much. Ah. Ah, is it okay now? My God. Now this will be equal to oh your thank you so much. One divided by one point two one nine six three five. That is this. And now I will get. Okay, so what did I do it? I divided each of this here, FI by the sum here, which shows that 82% of these molecules will be in the conformation A. This gives the population of that, 82%. That is the anti-conformation. The Gauss will be about 17.8%. That's almost close to like what she was telling. So this conformation B is 0.1%, conformation D is 0.04%. Is that clear to you how we are doing this? Huh? I'll just you know, pass here for a minute and see if you have any questions. So what I'm doing here is that I'm computing the populations of the four different conformations. Okay, that's what I have here. Okay. Is that clear to all of you? Any questions? This is applicable to all types of molecules. As long as we are able to get some kind of a relative energies, however empirical it is, one can get relative population of different molecules. So which is the dominant conformation? That is the anti-conformation. Colloquially we say that the dominant conformation is the stable conformation. Whenever you say stable, that is the most populated. Colloquially stable conformation is most populated. Okay, so we don't say most populated, especially in biology we say that it's a stable conformation. Any questions on this part, what we have done? Any questions? Sir, do we not use the term gauche for aliphatic molecules? Aliphatic? Uh -huh. well, uh, we, we had this butane example. So we do we use the term gauche for all, all uh, molecules? Gauche is the terminology that we use to denote any conformation which is from minus 30 to minus 90 are plus 32, plus 90. These are rotations about a CC bond. Generally, it can be for others also between any bond. So Gauss simply tells about the conformation about a bond. It can be an aliphatic, aromatic, it can be protein, nucleic acid, it can be anywhere. As long as we have a single bond, we don't uh, generally consider double bond, as long as we have so this Gauss simply tells any conformation in this range. So if you say plus Gauss, it will be this. If you say minus Gauss, it will be this. Okay. Did I answer your question or tangential? No. It can be in any. Huh? Here. In this population, yes, we well, divide by that by two, so you will have both of them. Plus Gauss half. Other curve because energy is same, no? Okay, okay. So what she is asking is that why did I take only one gauche where are both plus and minus are there? The energies are 0 0.9. So the two gauche conformations will be equally populated. In fact, you can actually put it as 0 0.91 and 0 0.9. It will not make much. It will be same, equally populated. You cannot distinguish them. Is that clear to what we have done so far? Huh? Okay. So now. I asked you about the femtomole of 10 power minus 15. This is one femtomole of butane, is it not? Into 10 to the power of 23 into 6.023, am I right? So out of this 10 power 8 molecules of butane, which one will be in, in anti-conformation, which one will be in Gauss conformation? Here it says that 81%, am I right? So there are about 10 to the power of 8 butane molecules. Which one will be, because they are all identical, am I right? 
So what determines which butane is in anti conformation or which one is in Gauss conformation? Did you understand the question? Suppose all of us are butanes, we are identical, okay, and we say that 81 percent of us are in anti and 17.8 percent of us are in Gauss. Who is in Gauss and who is in anti? What determines that? Okay, so to understand that, we use the what is known as the ergodic hypothesis. Okay, very important. What does it mean? Okay, suppose that you look at this femtomol of butane for certain duration of time. So this is the time window. How do we determine the time window? It depends on the technique you are using. Okay, so if you are using a some kind of a spectroscopy, you may use it for a maybe a collect data for a you know 30 seconds, maybe it depends on the sensitivity of the technique. What is the duration for which you are acquiring the signals? Okay. So during that time period, what we get is the time average. Uh, sorry, uh, we get the ensemble average. Whatever is the 10 power 8, you look at the ensemble data. So you collect data about a molecule, for example, butane, maybe you look at the, you know, suppose you are doing nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy, you look at the peaks, whatever data that you observe, that is an average over all the 10 to the power of 8 butane molecules of which about 81 percent are in the anti conformation, 18 percent are in the Gauss conformation. So that is the ensemble average, you get an average data. The signal you get is an average data. But suppose we do a thought experiment. In this thought experiment, what we do is that we do not take 10 to the power of 8, we take one single butane molecule, only one of them. We just take just like the model you have and observe it for sufficiently long period. That long is ambiguous, uh, is undefined. Suppose you, you know, observe one single butane for sufficiently long time. Do you know what this butane does? It spends 81 percent of time in the anti conformation, 18 percent in the Gauss conformation, 0 0.01 percent in the one eclipsed and 0 0.04 percent in the other eclipsed conformation. Okay. So this is what we say that these are equivalent, whatever you get over ensemble a group of 10 to the power of 8 butane molecules as opposed to observing one butane over a sufficiently long period of time. So no single butane is always in anti conformation or always in Gauss conformation, there is an interconversion. But at any given point of time, you will find 82 percent in anti, 18 percent in Gauss. Is that clear to you, ergodic hypothesis? Ask me if you have any doubt. Okay. Both are fine. Both are fine. How much time does a butane take to go from when I say that each butane can sample anti conformation, Gauss conformation, and both eclipse conformation at this percentage of time? How much time does it take to go from one conformation to other? That also we can calculate using this rate constant. Okay, so if you were to plug in the Boltzmann constant Kb, temperature and Planck's constant that is given here, this is the energy barrier. What is the energy barrier to go from A to C? What is the energy barrier to go from A to C? That will be B, energy of B minus energy of A, is it not? That was about 3.8. So if you plug in 3.8, you will get the rate constant that works out to be about 10 power 9 per second. That means in each second a butane can go 10 to the power of 9 times from anti conformation to Gauss conformation. And what will be the energy barrier to go from conformation C to conformation A? 3.8 minus 0.9, is it not? That will be about 2.9, so the faster will be there. So what you see is that when you have actually, you know, if you were to take butane or any molecule for that matter, there can be different conformations possible. For butane we identify two major ones, two minor ones. And the population of that will be determined by the relative energies. Because the one which is lowest energy is most populated, colloquially we call that as the stable conformation. Because that is what when you take a you know signal, any spectroscopic technique you do a signal, the signal will be dominated by the most populated. We think that that is the stable conformation. And the interconversion will take place based on this relationship. The exact energy barrier we cannot calculate for a in a cell what happens that is very difficult for us. 
these are what are known as gas phase or invacuate. Assume that there are no other barriers, only butane exists by itself, that is gas phase, there are no interactions, okay. So whatever we are discussing is applicable even for a cellular conditions. It's just that we don't know the energies to compute for the interconversions. But exactly this is something that is basic, you know, thermodynamic statistical mechanics. This is valid for all the molecules wherever, whichever universe you go. But basically I want you to know that what is the meaning of stable conformation? That's the most populated. There can be multiple conformations possible and the interconversion depends on the energy barrier. Okay, and we can actually take a sample of a protein or any molecule and take some measurement using some spectroscopic technique that gives the ensemble, whatever is the number of molecules, average value is what we get, but that will be equivalent to what each protein will do over a period of time. That is the ergodic hypothesis. Is that clear to you? I will stop here for a minute and see if you have any questions. Assumptions. What assumption is there, Pravalika? What I am saying is that you can actually get an ensemble average. That means you take, in this example, I have taken femtomol. You can take one mole, atomol, any amount. Whatever signal you observe for the entire collection of molecule, that ensemble, that will be same if you were to observe any one molecule for sufficiently long period of time. How sufficiently long depends on the energy barrier and how quickly it can interconvert. Why is the hypothesis true? Well, that is why it is hypo, otherwise I would have called ergodic theorem. It is a hypothesis. Huh? I am not aware of any formal proof of that. That is why it is still a hypothesis. We say that ensemble average and time average is equal. That is why it is a hypothesis. And this forms the basis for interpretation of almost all the data that we have. I'll check with my physical chemistry friends if there is any proof for this. Formal proof. In what way? Huh. What are the other things that you are telling? Other than non-stationary, I am not aware of that. Huh. I will talk to you after the lecture. I am not sure what you are telling. But we use this to interpret all data in biology. In what conditions? I will find out from my physical chemistry friends and I will also talk to you. Huh? Huh. Okay. Yeah, I, any other questions? I will talk to you. Find out. Any any other questions? Sir, firstly we discussed about transient uh, dipole formation in inert gases. Uh, we call it induced dipole, induced dipole. And uh, uh, then we studied that uh, this type of bonding is mildly attractive and strongly repulsive. Okay. Uh, if they come too close, then the uh, repulsion is very strong. Uh, but uh, if they are at an ideal distance, the attraction is there. Uh, it is very mild, but it is always there. By mild, we say magnitude is very small. Uh -huh. Energy. Uh -huh. Then we uh, studied the different conformations of butane. Uh -huh. uh, uh, studied their relative proportions. Anybody else? Are there any questions? I didn't understand what that and uh, like. What uh, is the hypothesis about? Like, uh, like we already got uh, like lower energy have more stable and. We, more um, I, this what it means is that when you have a collection of molecules, for example, butane. Hmm. Okay, if you were to observe at any one instant. Let me uh, see if I can give another example. Examples can be double S words. Okay, either it will help in understanding or it will make it more confusing. Okay, so uh, let me try, let me risk it. Okay. Prashant. Mm. So, our campus has 
13,000 students. Okay. What are all the places students go? Canteen. Canteen. <laughs> okay. Can we combine canteen and hostel? Okay. And then? Class. Huh? Canteen, lounge, okay. Everything together is hostel. Then? Classes. Classroom. Oh, not bad. <laughs> okay. And then? Huh? Lakeside. Okay. Lounge. <laughs> okay. Lakeside. Okay. I will use something different, say, let us say, gym, those of you who are, okay, maybe outside campus. In fact, we can distinguish even these things, but that level of distinction is not required now, okay. At any given point of time, Prashant, okay, it depends on the day of the week and time of the day, okay. Okay, let us fix any day and any time. How many of these 13,000 students will find in which places? You take any, just a discussion, I don't want real number and I'm not here to sort of make fun of students or you know, derive any pleasure out of anybody. I'm just want for a discussion. Give me some numbers. How many will you find in canton at any given, you pick any day, any time. Pick some number, it doesn't matter. 30. Huh? 30. How many will be there in canteen? How many thousand? Give some number, it doesn't matter really. Uh, for 3,000. 3,000, okay. Uh, what about the remaining 10,000? I can add library. <laughs> okay, so the library will be confirmation D, okay. So 3,000. What about the remaining, you know, so maybe this is, you know, 500. Is this too much? This uh, library doesn't have that capacity, 250. Okay, many things are online available. One is not in library, doesn't mean one doesn't read. Okay, so you pick some number. Okay, so maybe some, you know, 5,000 here, or in outside campus can be 1,000. You know, going to gym, 5, 6, 9. Okay, so that will be 4,000 minus 250. Something like that. It is not, doesn't really matter to me. Okay, so if you were to observe at some point of time, say now, where are the 13,000 students we can find here? Okay, this is the ensemble average. But if I were to ask Prashant, where does he spend time over a period of say six months, one year, he spends whatever 3,000 divided by 13,000. This much time in a canteen or lounge or hostel, 4,000 minus 250 divided by 13,000 time in gym, and 5,000 divided by 13,000 time in classroom, and similarly this. So one individual will spend, this is the proportion of time one individual student will spend as opposed to observing 13,000 students, that is the equivalence that we are telling. So where does and, that and rate... And we assume that all students behave in the same way because all are butanes here. What is that? Where does that rate constant come into picture? Huh? Like rate constant. What? Uh, that rate constant... Where is the rate constant? Like kinetic. Oh, that rate constant. How quickly you go from canteen to gym or to library? Barrier. This barrier may be very high. Once you get in, you may not be able to come out as you sleep. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that barrier is confirmation change. How quickly can a butane go from here? This is the barrier. It has to cross this barrier and go to this. These are valleys, these are peaks. So to go from here to here, how much time it takes? That's what we are looking at. That tells the rate constant. Okay. I think I will stop here. Uh, if you have any questions, you ask. I will continue with this and tomorrow we will discuss the Ramchandran plot. Okay.